Martin Perkins. You've uh, you've been sta- you've been MHK for Gar for the past five years. 2016 was the last time he was in a seat such as this, talking to Stu Peters back then, actually. Um, but this time around, tell me, to start off with, how, how have the last five years shaped the Martin Perkins that is standing for election this time around? It's been very interesting, actually. And I think, uh, well, Stu Peters is going to find out how to sit on the other side of the table, there, isn't he? But going back to the question you've asked, uh, I've got some unfinished business I want to uh, put in place. Uh, I know the ropes uh, and I think you're far better placed for your second round uh, of standing as an MHK uh, to know what you're letting yourself in for. And I particularly believe that the island is going to go through a massive upheaval with the economy. And that is my main worry that we can get the economy back on track because that was what pays for everything. Uh, And uh, we have to keep a diverse economy. And that that is going to be very difficult because I know that there are certain, uh, for example, precision engineering is going through the mill with a reduction in air travel um, and what have you. We need to get out there and, and get some good new business this good solid business back to the island you had quite a business head on your shoulders obviously from 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 your time before as M- before being an mhk do you think and also in in those earlier interviews you're quite upbeat you were prepared really bringing a sort of positive energy about the election process and standing to be an mhk do you think the past five years have dampened that spirit at all uh, there's certain things I got frustrated at in government, uh, but there are some wins I've had. Uh, and I, to be quite honest, I don't feel that the island makes enough of itself, uh, particularly recently with the COVID situation. We've all been stuck, you know, on on the Internet and going to Teams and Zoom and one thing or another. But uh, we really need to get out there, spread the word of the Isle of Man, get people over here that uh, are in business and really beef it up. And forgive me, Martin, but you were saying the same words five years ago. What have you done in that time? Well, I I originally started off in the DOI, but as a result of the um, Lord... Lord Liskay's report, um, things were changed and they reduced the number of uh, members in each uh, department. And because I had the IFT and DEFA, I I, I was the one that had to relinquish my position in DOI, or or DFE as it is now, which was disappointing because um, I was looking after shipping registry and and hoping to find new business and and one thing or another. Uh, And so I got moved across to DOI, but uh, I think I've hopefully made a contribution to the the uh, food producers associations that we have and uh, Manx Produce. Uh, so I was able to use my skills in uh, getting business, in, in organising people on the island. Do you think, obviously, Brexit has been a big part of the last five years, but bearing in mind Manx Produce, like you mentioned in there, and, and sort of widening the, 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 not, the knowledge, I suppose, the, uh, the, the reputation of Manx Produce further afield. Has Brexit damaged that at all, your work that you mentioned there? Well, when you look at Brexit, and uh, it's a phenomenal exercise. We, we looked at it in terms of laws that we we're going to have to change, and it was over a 1,000. And we managed to pare it down to over 850 bits of legislation that needed changing. And a lot of that, mo- the vast majority, was in DEFA. And, of course, we had to make sure that when we tweaked the law and changed it, we got the best advantage for the island, but also confirmed, conformed to international uh, organisation requirements. And I think the one good thing about COVID is that the local population have realised what we've got in our own produce. And we've got some fa- we've got a fantastic story to tell there uh, about uh, the Manx meat, the Manx uh, cheese, the dairy, all that good stuff. And I think people have started uh, buying Manx meat. The supermarkets are now getting their act together, finally, and, and getting Manx meat in the supermarkets. And we need to go forward on that and build on it. Um, How exactly do you build on that then? Well, with the food festival has been phenomenal. And the way that that has been marketed, uh, we've had Adam Henson and a few key people in that have really given it a boost. And the numbers have gone through the roof. And luckily enough, we're having it again in September. So again, we can we can build on it. We've got um, Christmas puddings that are in uh, the major supermarkets across. Uh, we've got Uh, gin and various other things that are being exported cheese going all around the world and for a small island like this I I think that is amazing and I think the um, uh, the fact that we are disease free there's no TB and we got fresh air clear water delightful grass to eat uh, certainly our dairy products are second to none 
So you think the way to the sort of the global platform is through its stomach? <laughs> well, you could say that. Well, an army marches on its stomach, doesn't it? But uh, no, I, th- I think that, that there is a lot to be said for that. But just coming away from that for a moment, I, I think the key to business and diversifying our economy, and Jersey and Guernsey would give their right arm to have a, an economy as diverse as ours. But we, we've still got to diversify it further. But the key to it, in my opinion, is getting the owners of the businesses to understand the quality of life we have here and relocating to the island. And I'm sure that is, is one of the areas which we have to have a really good look at going forward. OK, I just want to take another sort of retrospective look over the past five years and just ask you, what would you class as your sort of biggest achievement over that time? I think uh, in parliamentary terms, the organ doning and the human tissue bill, what started out as a fairly small bill um, which was the organ doning bill, which means that everybody has opted in unless you opt out of doning. Uh, we suddenly realised that uh, the uh, human tissue bill was so far out of date that that had to be modernised as well. And if you put Brexit and COVID on the back of all that lot, the uh, drafters of the legislation were absolutely up to their neck in, in work. And to sort of manoeuvre that through and get it through Timworld in time, and it was a close call. And we're still waiting. Hopefully we should get royal assent in the next few weeks. But it was a close call. And that, that for me, was, was my main, um, I would say, success. Okay, and obviously on the flip side of that question is what do you think has been sort of the lowest point of your past five years, something you'd like to have done differently? Um, I think department-wise, um, the um, uh, certain legislation that was, was that didn't go through on animal welfare, um, and I've got a feeling uh, the public didn't understand it well enough, and it was uh, confused with the Manx hares on, on the hillside, and misinformation got out there, and as a result, we lost a bill. So we're still no farther forward. And, and that but was members very... were very critical yeah. of that, regardless of how it went out there in the public. Obviously, the Manx hares was picked up by certain wildlife groups mm. over here as, a, as an opportunity that could be seized through that bill. But otherwise when it came before Tim World, everyone said it just wasn't good enough it wasn't prepared it, it there was leaps and bounds it could have gone through so where does the book stop well what was it better than what we've got you know and I think it, it, it was better than what we have at the moment but the the members weren't weren't happy with it and it just shows that democracy works but uh, I think in the next city in the next uh, administration this will be addressed um, as many other things uh, but th- this will be addressed in particular. And obviously, if you get back in, you'd like to be a part of sort of drafting that bill. Do you think there's anything you could bring forward to it now to to help the public better understand, to help the members better understand what that bill is trying to achieve? I think everybody uh, is uh, trying to get the best animal welfare we we can, uh, especially looking across at certain other jurisdictions. Their their welfare is is, is not good at all. Um, But, for example, puppy farming and stuff like that, we really need to get something in place to to stop that. Um, And, uh, yeah, it's going to have to be addressed in in any event in the next uh, administration. Okay, and you've held a couple of uh, sort of head roles in government over this over the last five years. Chair of the OFT, uh, first of all, how has that how has that gig been for you? Yeah, it's been very interesting, and, and I'm one of these politicians who gets stuck in. I don't like sitting on the sidelines throwing rocks. I think if you want to make a difference, you get your sleeves rolled up and you get stuck in uh, to something like the OFT, something like planning. They're um, quite contentious at times, uh, particularly the planning, as, as we know. But the OFT, uh, we're there to provide a service. We do debt counselling. We look after the uh, measurement of optics. We look after supermarkets, uh, the weighing scales in supermarkets. Uh, we keep an eye on fuel. Uh, we monitor the pricing. Uh, and it's a phenomenal amount of work that the OFT is involved with. During COVID, we had to, we were tasked with actually producing hand cleaner. Now, if you remember, we were down to virtually no hand cleaner at all in the hospitals, in the police force or in the, in the schools. We liaised with a local um, distillery and they produced the alcohol. Uh, they sorted out the dispensers because you had to have a dispenser that people couldn't drink out of and various other things. We got the government Allenst on board and within a couple of weeks we actually produced it and actually got it on the shelves in Manx supermarkets. So the OFT, there's a lot. Of, it, it, it gets a bit of a rough press from time to time, but it's there doing a good job. 
Okay, and obviously you mentioned planning. that word there, planning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were waiting for this one. Well, I thought it would probably come up. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously it's one of those situations. Planning, everybody talks about it. Everybody says it's not transparent enough. The the process is flawed currently. But let's just go back to some recent headlines about the elm trees. Yeah, we can and, talk about that because it's it's finished. You know, yeah. it's not an ongoing exactly. um, well, yeah, you, planning application. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And it, obviously, you were very pleased with the result that came came out of that. But you were still the chair of the planning committee that oversaw it yep. during the time, weren't you? Well, the planning committee followed everything to the letter of the law, and. You, you can't reproach them because they did everything that was required of them. Now, of course, planning does need looking into. And I, in the next administration, I will certainly make sure we have uh, a good look at planning. That's not to throw everything, you know, not not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we need to look at things like uh, the yellow notice, how clear it is. Uh, is everybody aware of it? Uh, do we need to, possibly? Um, we also need to look at um, people being advised of the planning. Now, if you put your email forward, you will get a list of all the planning applications of that week. Now... You can't spoon feed people any more than that. But is there a way we can perhaps get it down to postcode areas? Most of the commissioners do a really good job. They look at what planning is coming up in their area and they notify the people involved. Um, And also the... um, uh, with planning, you get winners and losers. The people that are successful think it's the best thing since sliced bread. The people that aren't successful in a planning application think it's absolutely awful and it's a completely closed uh, shop and, and one thing or another and, and really do it down. But the planning system has evolved over the years and I think there are one or two things that I've just said that need looking at and uh, if we can sort that out, then I, I think uh, it, it will leave us in a lot better place. What, what have you done to, to sort of combat those issues you've just mentioned there over the past year? Because you, you only moved into this role in 2020. Yeah, well, one of the first things I, I did um, was to make sure that a photograph was taken of the yellow document that is meant to be portrayed uh, on the actual planning property. And the officers actually do that. Uh, but, of course, in the particular case you're talking mm. about... Well, that was people, buried amongst the trees. Well, people go past it 60 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, whatever it is, and they don't see it. But it was there. And so, so, But why why looking at that s- scenario, knowing the stretch of road where people go past at 60 miles per hour and how obscured it was, why not flag that up and say something else needs to go out here? Well, that's what I was saying at the beginning. Mm. Do we need two? And, right. And, th- and that's the thing. Um, I think uh, the whole thing probably hinged on the fact that people did miss the yellow sign but of course uh, the uh, vegetation was growing pretty dramatically at that time Um, various things can happen but I can assure you it was put in the right place when it was first put up now um, as a result of it not being seen the commissioners missed it the first time round but they were informed I think it was one of the MHKs of the area and they said you've got 21 days you've got three days left get an application in to appeal this decision and they didn't come back to committee now had they done so it would have been a different story had the Manx Wildlife Trust come back or one of the back groups or one of the non-government organisations that look at this type of thing and they all follow them very closely Manx National Heritage they didn't come back nobody else came back to us and this is how it slipped through the net so it's obviously a key part of the process that we need to look at is there not a responsibility though to chase those groups before it's too late which groups do we chase that's the problem there's there's probably 35 non-government organizations from the fungi group to you 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 know you can reel them off and uh, i deal with them in defa under uh, um, the liaison committee for the wildlife so i know who they are but it's very you you can't spoon feed people and the problem is when you spoon feed people and uh, you you don't and they miss it then it's all your fault it's up to these guys to to look at what is going on and and monitor it closely if so you don't accept that the the uh, this situation was your fault at all, do you think? Where, where does the book lie? I think it's um, the due process was followed, but it, it, it failed. And as, as I said, the yellow uh, notice, uh, people not picking it up, not doing due diligence enough. Um, I don't think, um, you see, one of the problems is with planning, you have to look at the documentation in front of you. You cannot say, what if we do something else or what if they do something else? It's either cut and dried of what is in front of you. 
And that is how the decision was reached. And thank goodness we were able to liaise with the owners um, and uh, they're going to submit a second application uh, before any trees are cut down. So I'm hopefully hopeful that the second application will go through. One thing I should say is that the uh, the committee have been absolutely inundated with insults and hassle from uh, Facebook and the social media. And some of it was quite appalling, to be quite honest with you. And Anything to you personally? Uh, well, let's just say I'll put CCTV in on my house. I, I don't want to go any further than that. But uh, yeah, it is uh, it is worrying. But if you look at the local elections now, there's a lot of commissioners that haven't had enough applicants to stand. And I've got a feeling, uh, having spoken to a few people, that this is a direct reflection of social media slagging people off and people saying, actually, why should I put myself to this hassle? I, I don't need it. My family doesn't need it. And if we're not careful, the people on the planning committee are all bona fide uh, citizens, absolutely spot on, above board. They work hard. They go through all the documentation. They go up and have a quiet look at the the, uh, site. They put a lot of effort into it. And then to suddenly have it thrown back in their face on social media from somebody who hasn't read the reports, who doesn't know the first thing about it, is very frustrating for them. And I just hope that um, they they continue on in their, their position. Do you keep off social media? Uh, I do now. <laughs> Did you, you didn't before? I had a little bit of engagement, but the problem is you're fighting people that are there all day with nothing else to do. And when you're a busy politician, you're running planning the OFT and you're also in DEFA, there's a lot going on and you just haven't got time to, to spend you know, fighting people that are often ill-informed. You, you look at the new crop now, the, those that are standing for the first time uh, for the House of Keys this September. And what, what do you... What, what crosses your mind? Do you think they have any sort of idea about what they're what they're facing? I think um, they probably don't. And once you actually get into the nitty gritty of it, um, it is it is. It, uh, let's say it's a lifestyle rather than a job, and you've got to be a certain type of person to accept that, and your family has got to accept that, uh, and. Uh, it is very demanding, and of course, um, with the new pay scale that has been that will be in our next time, um, a lot of people, good people out there, will take one look at it and say, "Actually, I don't need the hassle of all this, and not even bother standing." Okay, I just want to focus now on on your constituency, on Garth, yep. on, on what you've done for that area. Because this Parliament and administration has received a fair bit of cr- criticism, actually, for being quite reactive and focused on legislation rather than sort of action and investment in community facilities and um, what forward thinking vision investment and action have you succeeded in bringing to Garth over the past five years well I don't know if you remember the October 2018 when the flooding first happened I was on the bridge at half seven in the morning and uh, saw the, the uh, water going down Glen Road and one of the first things I said on any of the interviews uh, that I had was we need one person to have a phone number where all the flooding responsibility lies because at that point in time it was spread across DOI, DEFA, Manx Utilities and it was somebody, nobody and everybody's job and that is how it got left and as a result of that I've sat down with various people and various meetings with the politicians, with the people in the various um, departments and we've made sure that that there is a special flood unit within DEFA, uh, sorry within DOI that deals specifically with flooding and I think that is a really good result uh, we've had uh, phenomenal work done on the Laxey Valley now. Um, it is, uh, and it's still going on, you know, and I, you feel your heart goes out to the people on Glen Road that are still struggling to get ins- decent insurance cover. Um, and also they're still being disrupted. Glen Road is shut because they're still sorting out the river banks, making sure that nothing collapses in floods. And I can't, uh, you know, uh, criticise the government on on that. Um, all departments have worked very well because DEFA, uh, they own various bits of it and DEFA owns the, the bit um, going up towards the um, Glen Roy and they've put in a um, uh, tree um, uh, yeah, mitigation, making sure no trees are going to fall in the river, all that type of thing. The DOI have put in this tree catcher and uh, it's, yeah, it's been a concerted effort. All the um, culverts have been cleared out and uh, we have a um, 24-hour watch on flooding uh, and people will get a text if they sign up to it that it is liable to flood and it has been a really good response. 
Okay, would you consider yourself sort of a, a lobbyist in government, a fighter for the people of Garth? Do you think they would regard you in that manner? Say if they came to you about a problem, something, a, a pothole's emerged outside of their front door. Are you sort of liable to go and take that to, to government and say this needs sorting out? Yeah, I mean, I think we all, all the politicians do, and uh, I, I've done that. I've um, helped people um, with various problems that they've had. Uh, you, you know, as a politician, you can't pull any strings, but you can signpost them to the right people within government. And that is, if you can do that, that that's a good start. Because if you just go through the internet on, on the government website, you sometimes draw a blank. But if you can get the right person with the right phone number and... I must say that government does normally phone them back, certainly about potholes. If you phone the DIY now, uh, they will make contact with the person and explain what's going on. If they can't get there this week, it will be a couple of weeks or whatever. And, uh, of course, you know, if you've got a pothole outside your house, everybody kicks off. Um, but the DIY are doing their very best to try and get it sorted. OK, so we're running out of time very quickly. It's over 20 minutes so far. But just finally, tell me why the people of Garth should vote for you. I think uh, I've uh, offer uh, a considered uh, view on politics in the Isle of Man. I fight my corner for the people of Garth, and I, having been in five years, I've got the experience and uh, know the ropes within government.